Good morning, Gateway Bible Church. Um, it is a, a grand pleasure to be here with you again. I would ask that you open your scriptures to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Two simple verses, maybe not so simple, but two verses today we are expositing from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Um, I got to tell you that uh, this morning's sermon title is Pillar and Ground, and I have a small uh, exercise, a task for you this morning. I would like for you uh, to turn to the person uh, on your left and your right, call one and say, good morning, pillar, and the other say, good morning, ground. Uh, Roger, Roger, you just, you shoot it out indiscriminately. Pillar and ground, uh, if you are in Jesus Christ this morning, and indeed if you are here a as a member of the family of Gateway Bible Church, you're a pillar. And you are also the ground. Don't believe me? Well, hang in there because we're going to examine this. Now, I want to tell you that as we uh, were traveling these 8,400 miles in our bus, over the last eight weeks, uh, I've got many, many chances to be in the Word. And I wanted something special. Oh, by the way, next week we're starting our study in Romans, and I'm excited about that, Romans chapter 1. But I wanted some a special message for you here today. And uh, the Lord spoke to me day in and day out uh, about His uh, pastoral epistles. And we'll talk about what that means here in just a little bit, but a special message, and I want to tell you, a day did not go by where these two verses were not seared upon my heart. And I want to do a little searing, or let the Holy Spirit do the searing upon your hearts here this morning. Uh, Paul, the apostle, as you well know, as you have been with us through the book of Acts, uh, was a man who was seared. And he was a man who did a lot of searing. Uh, nobody would say, believers, non-believers, anybody, nobody would say that Paul was not a man of passion. You can't, you can't say that. That passion drives his message for what we term the pastoral epistles. Now, who's we? Oh, I don't know. Some people in the seminary, theologians, whatever. It gets called the pastoral epistles. Why, Pastor Wayne, you might ask? Well, because it's about pastors. And more than that, it's about the church. Those three epistles, those three letters from the hand of, of the Apostle Paul, from the pen of the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are all about how to do church, and more importantly, how to do church correctly. That is what Paul is passionate about. The church's confession. What are they saying to the world about Jesus Christ, Paul writes. The church's conduct, how are they acting in the world to represent Jesus Christ? So today we look at Paul's description of the church. You will find it nestled in 1 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 14. I shall read it to you. Two verses, they're short, but we're going to pull them apart. Paul says, these things I write to you, young Timothy. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. Which is the church of the living God. The pillar and the ground of truth. Isn't that amazing? Note, if you will, in that description, there are three very graphic phrases. The first one, the house of God. The church is the house of God. Number two, the church is the house of the living God. And number three, the church is the pillar and the ground 
of truth, Paul says. Now, uh, lest there is any confusion, we cannot go any further because I want to just make a little definition here. Who is the church? Oh, I just gave it away, darn it. Pronouns are everything, are they not? What is the church? You understand that when you understand that pronoun. Who? It's not a what, it is a who. The church is not that drywall. In case any of you were thinking and said, that drywall is holy. Those light fixtures are God. You know, they are God ordained. We are the church. You are the church. Understand that as a foundation when we move forward through these two verses. Because when you understand that, and Paul does things like describe us as the pillar and the ground, well, that is very compelling. Now, the house of, the, uh, of God, church of the living God, pillar of ground and truth. Number one, let's break it down. Paul says we are the house of God. The church is the house of God. Now, I want to tell you, that that word there can be interchanged in this context with the word household and also the word family. So this is one of those areas where the concept of the family of God starts to bubble to the surface. For example, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So the church, my friends, is a family. Is it a body? Yes, but it is also the family. With God as the Father. With believers. With elders and deacons and servants and, and believers as brothers and sisters. All with one purpose. One purpose alone that this household, this family of God has. That purpose is to bring forth God's purposes. Amen? Amen. To help carry out the Father's purposes. Now, I, being of a large family myself, am fully aware that the, the word family has uh, profound implications because number one in this context we're talking about an eternal relationship as it turns out you and I are not in a temporal relationship in other words that only exists here on that earth if you are in Christ and I am in Christ we are brothers and sisters forever now the eternity aspect, I also am fully aware, has some people squirming in their seats. Because if, feel free to raise your hand, if you are like me, your families are not perfect. If you are like me. Uh, and uh, some of our families are, are a little uh, more, diff let's just say, more difficult than other families. And the idea, frankly, I'm not putting words in your mouth, I'm just giving you mine. The idea of spending eternity in that relationship might be puzzling for uh, many. We don't always get along. We are imperfect. But the good news is that while you and I are here on earth as brothers and sisters, we will also be in heaven as brothers and sisters, which means that we are the redeemed. There will be this perfection that we get to put on in heaven, which makes the idea of eternity with imperfect people a lot more palatable. Now, don't think, and I know it comes off, it sounds that way, that I'm that I'm making it look like uh, uh, living with the saints in a family here on earth uh, is not supposed to be glorious. It can be glorious. It can be wonderful. But only if one thing is happening, that we, you and I, are uh, pushing ourselves and are allowing ourselves to be pulled closer 
to God the Father. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> it's like a triangle, is it not? Everyone do this. Do this with me. Who's this? That's, that's Pastor Wayne. <laughs> Who's this? That's you. Who's this up here? That's God. If we are getting closer to God, what happens? We get closer to each other. Amen? And that, my friends, is glorious. That is wonderful. The closer we get to Jesus, the closer our relationship to him, the closer to each other. Now, that's, that's the first description. Uh, the household of God. Here's the second one that Paul offers up here. It is the church of the living God. Now, for those of you who are familiar with your Old Testament, you understand that that living God is spoken of all over the place. And usually when, when an Old Testament prophet or teacher speaks of the living God, it's in direct comparison to all of these filthy idols that the uh, cultures surrounding Israel were partaking in. And by the way, it's much the way, same way in the New Testament. Uh, the living God is used 15 times in the New Testament. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And you are the temple of the living God. Isn't that marvelous? Because... God dwells in us when we come together as the church, the ecclesia, the congregation of God. It is the great uh, glory of assembling together. That's what's happening. That's what's happening here this Sunday. On, from the very beginning, on the Lord's day, on Sunday, the first day of the week. As those first century Christians did immediately. And it's been that way ever since. All of us indwelt by the very dynamic spirit of God assembling together. And that gives me great encouragement. It gave me great encouragement when Val and I were on the road for the last eight weeks. It gave me great encouragement even when we went through some what can safely be called difficult times. The ability to be back here with you as fellow temples of God and the Spirit meeting together. Uh, how does this all work? Let me just break this down a little bit further. Number one, uh, uh, let's say it like this. Listening to the word of God on your own, separately, individually, is a good thing. Amen? Singing to God on your own, individually, in your car, in your closet at home, whatever it is that you guys are doing, that is a good thing. But singing to God together and listening to God's word together, it's better. It's better. Martin Luther said it like this. Martin Luther said, in my own house, I know you can identify, in my own house there is warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. Wow. This is why believers meet together. Amen? This is why we are commanded, not just in Hebrews chapter 10, which of course I'm going to share with you. I would be remiss not to. But throughout the New Testament to meet and assemble with the believers. This is what the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 24 says. And you know we've broken, broke, we, we, we've read this over the last year and a half. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And even more so, because the day, the day of the Lord, his return is approaching. Wow. TV church. No. 
sorry, I have to, sometimes pastors have to say things that are uh, not popular. No. Cyber church. No. It's not how we were designed as temples of the living God. Our temples are to come in, and my temple has to meet your temple. And we've got to exhort one another. We've got to correct one another. We've got to love one another. We've got to sing together and make this glorious, glorious noise to Christ. People indwelt by the living God need the real thing. By the way, eight weeks, where was Valerie and I on Sundays? We were in those churches that were teaching the word of God. And our temples were bumping into other temples. <laughs> in case you were wondering, Gateway Bible Church is the assembly of the living God. Amen? Amen. Now, here's the third designation that the uh, apostle uh, offers us by way of Timothy. We're the household, we're the family of the living God. And the third one, we are the pillar and ground of the truth. And those are striking architectural metaphors, are they not? Let's talk about the ground. And by the way, you full well know that Jesus offered up this same architectural metaphor. Houses built on sand, on rock. The ground is the, uh, is the buttress. It's our support, right? Ask any architect worth of salt in the, in the world, and he will tell you the most important part of his building is the ground. It's essential because that building is only as good as its foundation. So the church provides the solid bedrock of truth itself. And that is compelling considering that we know that you and I are the church. Then he calls us, he calls the church pillars. Pillars. What are those? Those are those columns. You can imagine them in Paul's time. You can imagine as we studied Paul in Athens and he went around and saw all of those great pillars. What do pillars do? They, they stand on that foundation. They stand upright and they provide two things. Two things. Number one, the pillar provides structure. That's obvious enough. You step out the door this morning and did you say, hey, I'm the structure of the church. Second thing they provide, beauty. Did you walk out your door this morning and said, I'm beautiful in Jesus Christ this morning? And by the way, I know this might be nitpicking a little bit, but I believe it's very important because I believe that the foundation of all cults uh, uh, is, lies in the truth that somewhere of what we're talking about right now. Does, here's my question, does the, or, or is the church, let's, let's say it like this, does truth come from the church? Is the church the progenitor of the church? Unequivocally, no, it does not. Of course it does not. It comes from God himself, amen? As pillars and foundations, we don't create it. We don't uh, do anything but pass it forward. Amen? Amen? John chapter 14, verse 6, what does Jesus say? I am the way, I am the truth. He passed that truth on to the apostles. The apostles passed it on to us. But when we're faithful to God's worth, we, word, we become foundations and pillars of God's truth in this world. That's how it works. Now, I know, friends, that that is an awesome responsibility. I have felt that responsibility keenly. Wanting to stand in the gap and speak truth, the truth of Jesus Christ to people, whatever that truth may be. Most notably, their need for salvation. I understand. 
In fact, that responsibility is so great that in the Old Testament, that truth of speaking truth to other people that God passed down to them was called a burden. You ever notice how many times in the Old Testament, whether it's Malachi or Habakkuk or Nahum, and it says what? The burden of the word of the Lord came to Malachi. It's a, it is a burden. It means it's an awesome, awesome responsibility. It's not a terrible burden. It's not going to crush us. Jesus said, come to me all those who labor. Lay your burdens upon me. My yoke is good, easy. My burden is light. So we, keep, we, we frame that in, in context. But it is a burden. There will always be a burden of sharing the truth of Christ with someone else. I'm, I'm going to break that down for you and tell you why that's the case. I would simply give you an example of Jonah. Do you think the, the, the word of the Lord was a burden for Jonah? Of course it was. Because Jonah was asked to go to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, who, by the way, in case you weren't familiar, was the most vicious group of people that had ever existed up until that time, and no one has surpassed them. I could tell you stories of what the Assyrians did. So it was a burden. And Jonah has to go in there and simply what? Does he create the truth? No, he brings the truth that God gave him. And all he does is go in there telling them what God told them to do. And guess what happens? The Ninevites do repent. They do have changed lives. God does relent from destroying them. Uh, another story for another day, but you full well know that Jonah was not that happy about it. Right? Remember that? There's a burden. Why? Because no matter who you talk to, people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, there are none, there is none who seeks after God. Isn't that amazing? Why? Why don't people want to hear it? Because it goes against their human nature. It goes against their heart's desires. That's what it is. And Jesus comes to say, I'm going to give you a new nature. Trust me, it's better. It's more wonderful. I'm going to fill you with a new spirit. You're going to get rid of that old spirit. And that's what he did. When we go through the book of Luke, when we went through the book of Acts, all of that, Jesus' ministry was about coming and replacing that and telling people. And then the apostles had to tell the people that they needed something radically new. But they just don't want to hear it. Some are saved. People are saved, and it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work in every one of those lives. He comes to the Pharisees, does he not? And, and he says, you guys have to radically be uh, different. And those Pharisees had all of their problems, right? They were the glory grabbers. Those are the ones that were constantly looking for human affirmation to say how great they are. Look at me. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. So they wore the long robes. They gave those public prayers. They coveted the best seats at the tables and in the house. They, they were uh, the ones who judged others without first pulling the plank out of their own eye. Change, Jesus says. The rich young ruler. You remember the rich young ruler? Master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus. Simple. Obey the Ten Commandments. Which ones, Master, in particular? Oh, you know, don't murder, honor your f a father and, and mother, do not covet. Woo! Check. I've done all that, Lord. And as he's walking away, what? Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, one 
thing that is lacking. You need to sell everything you have and distribute it to the poor. Yay! Is that what happened with the rich young ruler? Oh, thank you. No. What does the scriptures declare? He went away sad. The rich fool, the parable in Luke chapter 12. I've got so much stuff. I've got so much stuff. My crops are huge. I've got all these possessions. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build bigger barns. And I'm going to store my stuff. And I'm going to say, now I can eat, drink, and be merry. And to those people, Jesus comes. He also comes to those who, and his word needs to permeate those people who, for example, can't stand the uh, concept of absolutes in the first place. And we are in that culture now that when you, when you go and tell people about Jesus Christ, about your faith, and you're sharing their faith with them, and they say, well, no, this, this idea of one transcendent absolute truth, that's, uh-uh, that's archaic. Jesus experienced the same thing with Pilate. In, in his trial before Pilate, Jesus says this. Pilate asks him, Is he, are you a king? Jesus says, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And what's, what's Pilate's reply? It sounds so modern. Yeah, but you know, what is truth? Wow. That is the truth that we are encountering and that we have to stand in the gap with love and tell people that there is a better, better way, especially of salvation. Not everybody has ears to hear, right? How many times did Jesus talk, use that phrase, ears to hear, ears to hear. For those of you who have ears to hear, what does that term mean? It simply means that the Holy Spirit's working on them at that time and they're ready now for some reason to receive than they weren't just a few minutes ago. I can give you a perfect example of that because I know you're dying to hear a story from my trip, from Val and I's trip. Uh, we were, we have a 41,000 pound bus. We're about 50 feet long all together with our towing our car. And we can only fuel in truck stops. Cannot pull into a gas station to get diesel fuel because you, you can imagine the conflict. Uh, not the space, first of all, you tear off the canopy, right? And it's, it happens all the time, and it's not a mess, so we don't do that. Furthermore, if you go into a truck stop, the fuel flows at about three times the flow in a regular gas station. Big, giant nozzles, the pumps pump it out heavily. We have a gas tank uh, that has 150 uh, gallons of diesel fuel when it's full, filled up. Now, we go into the uh, station. All the trucks are in there. You've got to wait in line. It's very loud because trucks, truckers never shut off their engine. I'm getting, I open it up. I put my fuel in. Won't pump. Keeps turning off. I've never had the problem before in our life. And we've been living in this coach now for a year. Never one problem. We go in there, and every, it just, every segment would just shut off and shut off. And say, what's going on? What's going on? And um, I got this great idea. And that was that it needed to be vented. You see, there's one uh, a port on the driver's side, and there's another port on the, driver's, uh, on the passenger side. So what I did was I went over, and I opened that uh, port, that, that door, and unscrewed the cap, and, the, and it was breathing, okay? Now keep in mind that the one on the driver's side is about two feet lower than the one on the, uh, uh, on the driver's, the, oh, whatever, you know, what do you care? And so I'm pumping my gas. It's loud, diesel engines everywhere, no one's shutting off their engine, whatever. And I, I hear what sounds like the, uh, a, a, a sprinkler that has been sheared off 
and it's hitting the, um, uh, the, the sidewalk uh, on your lawn. You know how that sound is. But I didn't have ears to hear, you see. And so I'm thinking, well, that's interesting, right? Can't possibly have anything to do with me. And then, and this is what made me get the ears to hear, then I hear my wife of 30 some odd years screaming at the top of her lungs inside the coach, pounding. My friends, if you want to know what a diesel geyser is, I wish we had pictures, but it, but it came down here and it shot a lot. It shot all over the, uh, the fuel pumps and it spray got, cost a bit of money. So we got in and left really quick so no one would see that we were doing. No, I'm just kidding. Didn't happen. It got cleaned up. I didn't have ears to hear. Do you think now, in my life, if that happens again, I'm going to be, hey, what's that? What? That's ears to hear. And Jesus comes, even for us, we have to overcome. We, we tell people the truth of God despite whether they have ears to hear or not, because that is the realm and the domain of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now, that's why we teach our children the word. For those of you who have young children, you should be pillars and foundations of the truth to them. We can't do it all here ourselves. Every day you should be doing devotionals with your children. Now, here's... Those three things produce something very special in each one of us. A divine call. We must allow that word of God to saturate all of our life. Not some of our life, all of our life. As Bruce read for us this morning, Jesus says in John chapter 17, Lord, sanctify them by your, set them apart, change them radically by your truth. Your word is truth. Truth is to inform us, yes, but it's double-edged. It's to inform and it's to form. Once it has informed us, now we let it form us. God's word should be everything to us here in Gateway Bible Church. Now, those three graphic uh, phrases compose a very compelling uh, picture. Number one, as the church of God, we are the household of God, we're the family, we're together as brothers and sisters. Why? Because we share the same heredity in Jesus Christ. We are the church of the living God. When we come together, we come together as temples of the living God who indwells each one of us. We're alive, we're vibrant. And we are the very pillar and foundation, the ground of that truth. So here's the key. I want to end with this. The key to understanding all of this, especially as it relates to the pastoral epistles, especially as it relates to Paul's message to Timothy, the key is church conduct, how we conduct ourselves. Because as it turns out, there is an inexorable link to our witness and our conduct. Our conduct as a congregation. Let's go back to those verses. This is what Paul says. Let me remind you. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. You can see the passion and the urgency, the sense of urgency that Paul has to Timothy. I'm writing this letter to you, these things. Uh, I, I want to be, I'm coming to you shortly, but if, but if I don't, uh, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know what, how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So that you may know how to conduct yourself. Paul says, I'm writing these things. What things? Well, everything that's come up to that point. Paul tells how the church should be holy, how the church should be praying, how the, the order is to go in the church. It should be a church of order. Paul talks about how people should dress. Paul talks about 
uh, don't, uh, uh, don't concern yourself with endless genealogies. He, he tells uh, uh, Timothy exactly what to do, how to get elders and what kind of elder, what they should look like and deacons and all of that stuff. I'm telling you these things so that you will know how to conduct yourselves in the house of God. And by the way, in case you were wondering, what's the motivation for all of our conduct, everything? Well, it's evangelism. It's simply telling the truth of Jesus Christ to other people. Paul tells Timothy in chapter 2, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our, and uh, our Savior. Paul says to Timothy, This is good. And acceptable, what am I about to tell you? In the sight of God, our Savior, who desires a few men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that what it says? Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that becomes even more compelling when you understand that we are a family. We are a gathering of people indwelt by God. We, my friends, are the repository, the storehouses of God's truth. By the way, that's just exactly what the Ethiopian eunuch did. You know that story, right? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Not Philip the apostle, not Philip. Herod Philip. There were a lot of Philips in the New Testament. This is Philip the deacon that gets appointed. But in Acts chapter 8, it provides a model of exactly how uh, that spreading and opening up this repository of truth is and just opening our mouths for other people. The Holy... Uh, Philip is just outside of Jerusalem on the road to Gaza and he sees the Ethiopian eunuch you know, the guy who's in charge of Candace's treasury, the great queen of Ethiopia, leaving, this, this parade leaving. And the Holy Spirit says what? Get up and overtake that chariot. Start running. So that's exactly what Philip does. And he starts running. And there's the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch. And he looks over. And what's happening? The Ethiopian eunuch has got some scriptures open. And he happens to have that open to Isaiah 53, which says uh, he was led as a lamb to slaughter and, and he, he opened out his mouth. Here comes, the, here comes Philip and all he does is stand in the gap. All he does is what God tells him to do, to be the pillar and foundation of truth. That's it. No histrionics. No, none of that stuff. Just to speak the word. What, was he, what did he say? Uh, hey, you understand what you're reading? And he says, well, how can I if there's not someone to, to tell me what, 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 what's going on here? And, he, and so the Ethiopian eunuch asks, and he says, well, let me ask you a question. Does this passage, he opened not his mouth, uh, he was led as a lamb to his Is that speaking of the prophet who wrote it? Or is it a speaking of somebody else? And what, is, and what does Philip do? It's Jesus! It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And then it says that he opened up the scripture and he just told him the truth of the scripture. And what happened? That Ethiopian eunuch said, well, let's get to water. Let's get baptized now. Isn't that amazing? When the people of God live out who and what they are in Christ, God is very, very pleased to spread out that truth. This is what fixed my mind for the last eight weeks that we, not just Pastor Wayne, oh, it'd be so easy. If it was just Pastor Wayne, that guy up there, we are that very pillar and truth of God's word. And it is awesome. And it is a responsibility. And I'm excited to share with you what's going to be coming in the next several weeks. I'm also excited to share with you the, the book of Romans and that we will start next, next Sunday. Would you close your scriptures with me?